And next to another difficult situation in the world, the Ukraine conflict. When Ukraine marked in February the first anniversary of the Euromaidan uprising that toppled this Russia-leaning president, thousands of demonstrators in Moscow held what they called an anti-Maidan march. The opposing demonstrations are just another example of the deep divisions we're seeing between Ukrainians and Russians. VOA's Daniel Sheriff has covered the Ukraine conflict from both sides of the border. Tell us about this protest that you covered in Moscow. Yes, uh, the anti-Maidan uh, group helped to organize a, uh, a large uh, protest march that went through the center of Moscow. Thousands of people, they say they are, uh, had about 50,000 people. Uh, the authorities estimated somewhere around 30,000 people. Uh, and this was a counter march to the uh, Maidan uprising anniversary that was taking place uh, in Kiev. Uh, basically expressing their view uh, that the Maidan uprising against Yanukovych uh, was a coup, was uh, a lot of them believe was organized by the United States, by the European Union. There are a lot of conspiracy theories that they put forward. Now let's flip to the other side of the Maidan protests and talk about the Ukrainian views. More than 5,300 people have died in eastern Ukraine since April, most of them civilians caught in the crossfire. At the Kramatorsk Memorial, some hold signs blaming Russian President Vladimir Putin, accused by the West of arming the rebels, a charge he denies. City Council member Volodymyr Ryzhavsky calls the Kramatorsk attack a crime against humanity. Ukraine is bleeding. How many innocent victims will the world need to stop the aggressor and make him answer? Daniel, you, you, know, you mentioned the civilian deaths and some of the video that you got, you know, you showed bodies under blankets and various things. I mean, when you come upon a scene like that, what are your, what are your thoughts? What, did, what goes through your head? Well, in a situation where there are uh, rockets falling on the place where you are, uh, of course, your biggest concern is always uh, safety. Um, and so we you know, uh, immediately put on our helmets and flak jackets uh, when we heard about the uh, attack on the city. Uh, and, you know, being concerned about where, where you step is, of course, an issue if there is unexploded ordnance possibly nearby. Um, so we try to tread as carefully as possible. Uh, and also um, in a situation where civilians have been killed, where uh, people's uh, cars and uh, homes have been hit with explosives flying from the sky, uh, people are scared and they're um, upset and they're angry and it's difficult to uh, to approach people as a journalist. Uh, you don't want to be uh, offensive or anything like this, but you do want to uh, hear from them. You want to give them a voice uh, to express their anger, to express what they feel uh, when their peaceful neighborhood becomes part of a war zone. And you also spoke to people who have been forced to flee their homes. What are they feeling right now? Uh, a lot of fear. Raisa Nechayeva and her granddaughter share a room with another family displaced by fighting in eastern Ukraine. Since July, they have lived at the Holy Mountains Lavra and Cave Monastery in Svetohirsk, which now houses 700 displaced people. The Lavra is a godsend for families like Nichayevas, whose apartment and hometown of Horlivka continue to be devastated by shelling. I live in a high-story building. My son stayed there. He's not going anywhere. All the windows are broken, the balcony is destroyed, and when we call him, he says he is shaking and sitting in the bathroom. So what is it going to take then for this fighting to end for good? Well, that's the big question. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think uh, we're going to have to see a lot more effort um, amongst the world leaders that we've seen so far. We're going to have to see uh, some more substantial uh, and fundamental um, offers being placed on the table than, uh, than what we've, uh, what's been achieved. In order for Ukraine to take back control of that border, which is envisioned by this agreement, um, they're going to have to give up uh, that control. And that's going to be very difficult uh, for the rebel side uh, and for Russia to accept.